Back when I could listen to my mother, she'd tell me who I was to be. That is, some mornings upon entering me mom's bedroom, I would be greeted with, well, mother, I've been wondering where you were. Thus, I knew to become my mother's mother. Good morning, Betty Elizabeth, I answer. And how did you sleep last night? I slept with my eyes closed, says she, pleased as punch. Together we laugh as I lower the bed rails. Mother, says she to me, do I have to go to school today? Can't I stay home with you? Well, we'll see. First, how about some breakfast? Oh, good, I'm hungry. What would you like for breakfast, I ask? <gasps> Scrambled eggs, bacon, codfish cakes, and toast. And a banana, and a banana. Other mornings, me mom greets me with, well, Dorothy. And then I know to become her sister. Frank, my dad, Frank, didn't come home last night. Oh, he and Don, my uncle, they're away on a business trip. They'll be back on Friday. What day is today, says me mom. Oh, let's see, Wednesday. Ah, and then there are those times I get to be me. Well, Liz, those mornings remain my favorite. Listening to my mother kept me living in the moment, for that's where she lived, either in the moment or the distant past. Listening to my mother also taught me, how to help, taught me how to help her feel happy. Since she was good in spelling, throughout the day I'd say, hey mom, how do you spell? Always, she knew. Thanks, I say. Large becomes her smile, relaxed her posture. Well, I remember that time we visited her tall, handsome doctor. Mom really liked Dr. McCormick. Seeing herself through his caring eyes, I think she saw herself as a whole woman, maybe even a pretty whole woman. My mom was lucky. Except for dementia, she was healthy. So most, mostly she and her doctor just chatted. Oh... But then came the questions, those cognition questions. What year is this? Who is the president? What day is today? Do you know where you are? I watch me mom grow small, deflated, sad. She looks over to me for help. I can only shake my head and shrug. I ache for her pain. Well, Betty Bell, says Dr. McCormick, can you spell world backwards? Dr. McCormick glances over at me and winks. She gives, she gives him the hairy, mom gives him the hairy eyeball. And then she looks over at me and back at him, and she grows tall in her chair. She throws her shoulders back and announces, D-L-R-O-W. Surprise, Dr. McCormick and I look at each other and then back to her. Oh, how she got us. Together we three laugh. And still, I laugh. Mom was also really good in math. Halloween was when she got to strut her stuff. Under her head, I'd perch the tall black witch's hat, and into her lap, the big basket of candy. And then in her bright red wheelchair, I'd wheel me mom to the front door and out onto the porch. In the city, Halloween is very big. The line of princesses and superheroes and angels and devils and fairies and their parental or big sibling escort stretches all the way down my driveway. With each trick-or-treat, after first admiring the costume, I ask, so what grade are you in? Fourth, 
the young voice announces proudly. Hmm, let's see. What's seven plus two minus four times two, I ask. Oh, before our eyes the child deflates. Oh, you can do it, I say. You can use your fingers. Mom and I and the escort watch. The child, completely absorbed in those little fingers, looks up. Ten? Let's ask the good witch, I say. Hey, mother, what's seven plus two minus four times two equal? Ten, says she. Ten? I repeat, ten, the big, the child in front of me proclaims to all the trick-or-treaters down the driveway. Well, it's been three years now since I listened to my mother that one long week in hospice. She, completely comatose, me holding her hand. I like to cool her fever with a wet washcloth. Her face, her neck, her shoulders, arms, legs, feet. Seems like it was day four. I was done wiping her down, but not finished. Returning to the head of her bed, I again wipe her forehead, and then I wonder aloud, Mom, would you be upset that I'm wiping your face with the same cloth that I just wiped your feet? <laughs> she sits right up in bed, I kid you not, <laughs> eyes wide open, hello, says she, and then lies back down and returns to her labored breathing. The next day, or maybe it was night, in hospice, day and night feel the same. I am sitting there holding her hand and looking across the room when I see her standing right there in front of me on the other side of the bed. She's walking towards me. She's younger, happy, peaceful, radiant. And that's how I come to feel, happy and peaceful and just filled with love. Wait a minute, Mom, I say, turning my gaze from the woman standing before me to the woman in the blue gown lying on the bed. We're in hospice. I look back to the place where she'd been standing, and she's gone, vanished. Ah, but the peace and love remain. Finally comes night seven. Pay attention, I hear my heart say. It's about time. I start. I take a few deep breaths and I stand up and I rub my face and I return to my chair and I take her hand with both my hands and I watch intently. And maybe after five minutes of... <sighs> One long, deep breath, silence. It is finished. I hang my head, and there on the bed, just to the left of our still-held hands, I see a cross, the empty Protestant cross that I'd grown up with. And there, to the right side of our hands, I see the Catholic cross, the one with the body on it. And then I hear, I kid you not, they're the same. They're the same. It's just a body. They're the same. It's just a body. Thanks, Mom, I say. I love you. And my heart hears, oh, I love you too. <laughs>